I want you to put your hands together right now and give God the praise because we are going to have to. Amen. Calvary friends and guests. Here we are again, another week up, another week down. Is it just me or does it seem like time is going in warp speed? Regardless, remember what Paul told the Ephesians, make the best use of your time because the days are evil. Then we can say with conviction what the master said when it's all said and done. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have called me to do. Come, let us magnify the Lord together. Welcome to Calvary Sunday morning worship service. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are your deacon and deaconess, and we are inviting you to join us in devotion this morning. Good morning, Calvary. I am Sister Bessie Thornton, and I will be bringing you your scripture this morning. I will be coming from Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. So if you want to get your Bibles or your iPads or phones out, I shall begin reading. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderations be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Have a blessed day. We all prepare our hearts for prayer. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, Father of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob, our Alpha and our Omega, our beginning and our everlasting. We come now this morning, thank you, Heavenly Father, for a good night's rest as we slept and slumbered last night, Heavenly Father. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for touching us with your finger of love, Heavenly Father, and waking us up this morning, Heavenly Father. Clothed in our right mind, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come now, Heavenly Father, to praise your name, Heavenly Father, to glorify you and to magnify you, Heavenly Father. But Heavenly Father, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for food, clothing, and shelter, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for a mode of transportation this morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being God and God all by yourself, Heavenly Father. We thank you right now for Calvary Baptist Church this morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for each and every member, Heavenly Father, each and every leader, Heavenly Father. Touch them in a mighty special way, Heavenly Father. Guide and direct them, Heavenly Father. That, Heavenly Father, we may be guided and directed by them, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we just ask now, Heavenly Father, for healing in this land, Heavenly Father. For both healing physically and spiritually, Heavenly Father. Touch us, Heavenly Father, one by one, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we ask for prayer for revival, Heavenly Father. Revival of this church, Heavenly Father. Revival of our souls, Heavenly Father. 
revival of our minds to have a father, revival of our spirits to have a father, revival of our hearts to have a father, creating us a clean heart to have a father, and renew the right spirit within us to have a father. Heavenly Father, we just ask now, Heavenly Father, that your word just go out boldly into this land, Heavenly Father. Touching and agreeing, Heavenly Father. Touching those that don't know you've been a part of their sins, Heavenly Father. That they'll come and come around and say, what must I do to be saved, Heavenly Father? Heavenly Father, we just come out this morning just asking, Heavenly Father, for your forgiveness, Heavenly Father. Forgiveness of our sins, Heavenly Father. The things that we said, Heavenly Father. Things that we've done, Heavenly Father, places that we've gone, Heavenly Father, that we should not have, Heavenly Father. We just thank you, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you just come to Heavenly Father, blessing us now, Heavenly Father. Just creating us a clean heart, Heavenly Father, and renewing the right spirit within us, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we just come down to Heavenly Father, asking, Heavenly Father, that you be with the one, Heavenly Father, that will stand in John's shoes, Heavenly Father. And will declare your word this morning to Heavenly Father. Speak to him, to Heavenly Father, that your words will be spoken to us, to Heavenly Father. Open up our minds, hearts, and ears, to Heavenly Father, that we may be able to receive the word on high, to Heavenly Father. And go from this place, to Heavenly Father, a little better than whence we came, to Heavenly Father. Now, to Heavenly Father, you are the power, and we are the clay, to Heavenly Father. Mold us and make us and shape us to what you would have us to be, to Heavenly Father. And we'll be careful to give you all the honor and all the praise. But we ask all these blessings in God's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Calvary, God bless you. It's Sunday morning and it's prayer time. This Sunday morning, I want to make a, take a little different approach uh, to the prayer request. Sunday after Sunday, I pray for the overall welfare, the spiritual being of the Calvary Baptist Church, and I pray for those who are hurting across this globe. I had a very unusual experience uh, that I cannot contain this week that I must share with you and then you'll understand my reasoning for the focus of prayer on this morning. On this Tuesday, as I was sitting in my office with my secretary going over a list of to-dos for the week, the conversation changed to uh, her being brought up in the South. And so when I asked her of the little town that she was brought up in in Mississippi, she mentioned a little small remote town that many people have never heard of before. I had heard of it and I recalled preaching there before and there for church business in the past. And I recalled I had a friend there that I had not spoken to in over two years, maybe longer. It took me a while to adjust to, to remember his name. But when I called his name, I asked uh, my secretary, did she know him? She said, the name sounds familiar called his name a second time, and I had not spoken with him in over two and a half years. And when I looked down at my phone, it was a text from that pastor. My knees shook. I was totally caught off guard because I had not mentioned his name. I had not called him. We had not spoke. And so when I showed uh, the text to my secretary just to confirm what I had just seen, that something, a serendipity or epiphany or something unusual to happen. I said, let me call him because he'll never believe this if I don't have a witness. And so I called that pastor and shared with him or put him on speakerphone and, um, and I shared with him that my secretary was there and I, and I told him to, to just tell her how long has it been since we had talked and he confirmed that it had been over two years. And then I shared with him that it was a minute after I mentioned his name that I looked down and I saw that he had texted me. Now the odds of that are, are very slim. Uh, the odds are so many to the one, which was me on that day. But it, it shook me so that I knew that there was something magnetic, charismatic, spiritual about the situation. And so I began to pray and ask God to reveal to me the, the nature of this text. But he sent me right back to the text itself. And the text said simply, Pastor, I would that you would join me in prayer for pastors during this virus. Pray for their physical, their spiritual, and psychological health. None of us have pastored through a pandemic before, and many of us have gotten things right and we've gotten things wrong. But I want to be on the right side of that request because I believe that it was a direct commandment, a mandate from God for me today. And so I would that you would bow in prayer with me as we not only pray for one another, but we pray for those who are given leadership across this country, who've made some mistakes, who've perhaps gotten some things right, never passed through a pandemic before. Let's pray. God of grace and God of mercy, Lord, we know that you speak in sometimes unusual ways. It is our charge to be obedient to your will, your way, and your wishes. And so, God, I personally thank you for speaking in the way that has arrested me throughout the course of this week. I thank you, Lord, for uh, my secretary who was there and the pastor who made the text. Uh, for confirmation and I pray right now God that you would move by your spirit to touch pastors across this country uh, some are under the heavy weight of pressure and even persecution as they give leadership to your people I pray oh God that you would strengthen them not only spiritually but physically and psychologically 
I pray for the people that they lead. I pray, oh God, that the spirit of love will permeate throughout the church of Jesus Christ, that our light might so shine against the backdrop of a dark world in dark times. Wherever there's suffering, wherever there's hunger, wherever there's poverty, wherever there's human suffering, Lord, whether it is local or abroad, ask, oh God, that you would move by your spirit. We pray for the world in which we live. We pray for spiritual as well as heal, physical healing, as well as racial healing. We pray, oh God, for a healing as it relates to this COVID-19. And then, God, we pray for revival in the land, that the church would be revived to do that which you have called for her to do. And then, God, we pray that your word would go forth with power. We pray for those members who are sick, those who are ailing in spirit. We pray for those who are bereaved. And God, we ask that you get the glory out of our gathering on this morning. It's in the precious, the powerful, the preeminent name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our soon coming King. We count it all joy through faith. Amen. And thank God. He my soul. Yeah.
I certainly pray that you have your Bibles. Let's get our Bibles and let's go together. Ready? Aim. Fire. This is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It is my weapon. It is my roadmap in enemy country. In my Bible is found the plan of salvation. Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. It is by our humility towards our Christ, hospitality within our congregation, hard work within our communities, that the unsaved will be one to Christ. Come go with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter six. A very familiar story once again. We pre certainly pray that God will give it the diamond treatment and shine some light from a different direction that there might be some fresh illumination. Daniel chapter six, and for sake of time and for sensitivity of this task, I wanna encourage you to read the entire chapter of Daniel six, for it indeed again, once again, constitute the context in which we are preaching. But just for sake of time and sensitivity of the task, I wanna just aim our sermonic spotlight on verses 10 and 11 verses 10 and 11. Once again, familiar story, but don't let the familiarity block out what God is saying to us in this story. Reading from chapter 6, verse 10 and verse 11, it reads on this wise. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chambers towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Amen. Let's stop right there. I want to place tag on this text. And for the purpose of preaching, I just want to simply tag this where battles are won, where battles are are one. My brothers and sisters, believe me when I tell you that if you've lived any time for the Lord, and if you expect to do anything great from for the Lord, there will be those who will try your faith, where you'll have to defend your faith, even your integrity, and maybe even have to defend the favor upon God in your life. There are people with a limited vision in life. And believe me when I tell you that people with a limited vision for themselves cannot see a larger vision for you. And it's at those times when they take aim at God's blessing in your life that we don't respond as the world does that we do not engage in verbal assaults going backwards and forth, no fist to cuff. Instead of responding, here it is, we retreat. Instead of responding to your haters, retreat to your help. Here's my sermon in a sentence. Wake up and write this down. Victories are not won on the battleground. Victories are won on your prayer ground. This is the story of Daniel. Daniel, whose name means God is my judge. You got to understand the unique background as it relates to Daniel. Daniel was one of many young men 
that were brought from the hills of Jerusalem down to the lowlands of Babylon. At the age of 16, King Nebuchadnezzar decided to go to Jerusalem to rob them of their most productive, their brightest, and their most brilliant minds. Among Daniel was Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel was bright, he was magnetic, he was charismatic, and over and over again, here it is, the Bible says that Daniel had an excellent spirit. Daniel was an excellent spirit. Let's fast forward a little bit. King Nebuchadnezzar is not no longer on the throne, but now his son Belshazzar is on the throne. And the thing we must understand about Belshazzar is that Belshazzar did not want to hear any word from the Lord. He didn't want to talk to the prophet. Every king had a prophet that shared with him the word of the Lord, but not Belshazzar. Belshazzar did not want to see the prophet. He did not want to hear the prophet. Anything that had to deal with what God said, Belshazzar did not want to hear it. But it was one night, all of that changed. Belshazzar decides to throw a party. God at the midnight ball shows up in a miraculous way. Can't you imagine it in your mind? The music is playing, the flute, the satbuck, the psaltery, and all of the, the flutes. Belshazzar is now having a party. Bible lets us know that his girlfriend, concubines are there. And evidently, here it is, the party is going so strong that Belshazzar decides to go and retrieve the holy vessels of God, the silver and gold chalices of God. And Belshazzar begins to party, mix it up, drink wine from the chalices, the holy oracles of God. He disrespected that which was holy and sacred of God. But after a while, you know, it only takes so long that the Lord will put up with because the Lord showed up at Belshazzar's party. And you got it. He showed out. He did not even honor Belshazzar by sending his whole hand. But Daniel 5 says that he sends his finger to write over against the plaster of Belshazzar's wall. And the inscription that God writes, no one is able to interpret. But someone remembers that Daniel has an excellent spirit. And Daniel has the gift of interpretation and that he has this beautiful God spirit emanating from him. And so they call Daniel in and Daniel is able to interpret the writing on Belshazzar's wall. The writing says, many, many tackle you farson, which is interpreted. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. He interprets that writing to Belshazzar and he says, put simply, at the end of the night, you're a dead man. God's going to show up. God's going to show up. Let's fast forward some years later. By the time we get to the text, Daniel is an old man. He's at least 80 years old. And now Darius is now on the throne. And commentators and critical theologians says that different dispersions were now going back uh, to Jerusalem. And Daniel has become a man of prominence and position uh, he's respected, impeccable integrity, and the king discovers that there is some malfeasance in his record-keeping books and his financing. And so he decides that he would want to put someone with integrity over that. And so verse 3 says that Daniel was preferred. Did you see that in verse 3? It says that he was preferred. Over three princes or three presidents, Daniel was made number one. He was the chief. He was the head person in charge, come all the way as a slave from the hills of Jerusalem. And now he's in charge because verse three says Daniel was preferred. Now, I want to make it clean, uh, perfectly clear that in verse four, now that Daniel's in charge. He's placed over these other two 
president, believe me when I tell you that there's always going to be some jealousy. There's always going to be some backlash. Whenever God prefers you, someone is going to persecute you. And so here's what happened in the text. These, these other uh, people behind Daniel, now that Daniel's been lifted to this seat of, of authority, they begin to think in their mind, now, we know Daniel's not all of that. And, and so although he appears to be such a good guy, we've got to find something on Daniel to discredit him. And maybe I ought to place a, a court in the meter right here and say, that whenever people can't find something on you, they'll, they'll make up something on you. And this is what happens in the text. And let me uh, expand my homiletical license and exegetical genius to kind of give me, me some, some literary license to, to use my imagination. My imagination suggests that these men are looking for something about Daniel that they can discredit to take back to the king. And I want to suggest that perhaps they tapped uh, his phone uh, they went through his Facebook account to see if he had any obscene pictures on there. They went looking through his garbage can to see if they could find any empty liquor bottles. Or, you know what I'm talking about. They were trying to find something to discredit Daniel, but they couldn't find anything. And so they discovered that there was one thing that Daniel did have that was undeniable. Daniel had a relationship with his God. And they noticed that Daniel practiced or had a strange practice that he, he went through every day. In the morning, Daniel would get up, raise his window towards the east, he'd get down and he'd pray. At lunchtime, he'd go home, raise his, end, his window towards Jerusalem, and he'd pray. At the evening time, before the sun went down, he would, he would raise his window, and, and he, Daniel believed in prayer. Daniel had a prayer life. Daniel knew that there was something about prayer that, that act activates the GPS tracking system of heaven. That no matter what you're going through in times of trouble, that we have help in the time of need. Daniel believed in prayer. And this is what they tried to use against Daniel. They go to King Cyrus and they say, O King, live forever. Uh, we want to offer or initiate a, a decree that no one would bow their knees to pray or out of respect to anyone but the king for the next 30 days. And the king, not knowing uh, what was behind the plot, he signed the decree that anyone who was caught praying, bowing their knees to any other deity or any other god or leader that they would be thrown, here it is, in the lion's den. In the lion's den. Well, he, here is the pivotal point <laughs> of this text. I like this text. I really do. Because when Daniel finds out that the decree has been signed, Daniel does not cower. He does not start a fight. Look at verse 10. When Daniel finds out that the decree was signed, he makes a beeline back to his crib, I mean his house. He goes up the stairs. He opens his window towards the east. He gets down on his knees and he prays. That's civil disobedience. That's the church militant at its best. Doing what's right in the eyesight of God as opposed to what men say is right. Daniel gets down on his knees and he prays. And the men catch Daniel praying. And they go back and they told the king, King, you signed that decree. And we found your boy, Daniel, praying. And because the king had signed the decree and he liked Daniel, genuinely had a respect for Daniel. But because he signed that decree, he had to honor that decree. And Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. That's the story. Here's the lesson. Because there might be someone who's listening at me to saying, Reverend, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. 
I've been attacked on all different sides. I've tried to do the right thing. I've tried to stand for what's right. And from out of the woodworks, people come up with false accusations, criticism. How do you handle life? What's the lesson in this lesson about Daniel? Here it is. There are three things I see in this lesson. First thing I want you to understand that when God prefers you, expect, no, get used to persecution. I'll say that again. When God prefers you, expect, no, get used to persecution. When God prefers you, watch the movements in the text. Verse 3 says that Daniel was preferred. Here it is. It's the Hebrew word, yasa or natsa, which literally means uh, to glitter from afar. It means to be chief among many. Here it is, that in a constellation of stars, Daniel would outshine them all. He was preferred. He shined. He was brilliant. He'd walk into the room and light up the whole room. But when God prefers you, expect no, get used to persecution. Here's another movement in that text. Not only when God prefers you, get, get used to and expect, expect get used to persecution, but God prefers you. Here, here it is. Here it is. God's preference is not based off of external visual effects. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. I'm going to say that again. God's preference is not determined by external visual effects. What do you mean by that? It's not how tall you are. It's not how good you look. It's how not, not, not how much money you got in your bank account, how many friends you got on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever it is. God's preference has nothing to do with external visual effects. Here it is, Lane Colos. God's preference has everything with an internal spiritual disposition. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen because watch this movement in the text. It was not based, God's preference was not based on an external extremity. God's preference to Daniel, don't miss this, was based on his internal spiritual disposition. The text says that Daniel had an excellent spirit. Can I break that down for you? That, that word excellent simply means preeminent. And the word spirit comes from the Hebrew, Hebrew word rock, breath, wind. What it simply meant is that the spirit of God was in Daniel. And God's spirit emanated from Daniel. In other words, Daniel, O.T. Moses' translation, had a good attitude. Daniel was the type of person that would walk up and walk in the room and the whole temperature would pick up. Daniel was the type of person that had a good attitude that that spoke to you and it changed the whole course of your day. Daniel was the type of person that when you felt down just his mere presence would lift you up. Daniel had a good attitude. That's a warning this morning for people with a nasty attitude. You know who I'm talking about. They walk in the room and you say good morning and they say what's so good about it when you have a good attitude it's, it's God's able it's God is able to lift you up to places that you never thought you would be Daniel had a good attitude and good attitudes will move you higher your, your, your gifts or your talents might get you there but your good attitude will keep you there. It's what we call emotional intelligence. Being able to, to monitor your own emotions and those of others for a victorious outcome. Daniel just had a good attitude. I'm preaching this because there are short-sighted, limited vision people all over the world that cannot see a larger vision for you because they cannot see a larger vision vision for themselves. Can I push that just a little bit? This is how people are not able to see the value of Black Lives Matter because they have a limited vision of themselves and therefore they try to suppress Black Lives Matter through unabashed sophistry, acting as though they're, they're innocent knowing that Black Lives Matter and that no lives matter until all lives matter. Here's the question and I'm in my seat. I got three points. I'm going to sit down and shout my own self happy. The question this morning is how 
do you handle life? When God has set you up, he's preferred you. But when you're dealing with the battles of life, not just the battle that Daniel deals with. I'm talking to somebody who's dealing with a spiritual battle. I'm talking to someone who's dealing with a health battle. I'm talking to someone who's dealing with a battle on your job. Let's follow the cue of Daniel. There's no raised fist. There's no jumping up and down on no emotion of a, pog a pogo of emotionalism. He does, not, he does not respond to his haters. Here it is. He goes straight to his help. He goes straight to God because his battle is not won on the battlefield. It's won on the, on the prayer ground. Let me show you. I gave you three points and I'm in my seat. Here's the question. How do you handle life in situations like this? I love the way you ask questions. The first thing I want to suggest that this text lifts up is retreat to your prayer ground. And let me pause right here parenthetically and say if you don't have a prayer ground to retreat to, you ought to establish your own prayer ground. Daniel goes right back to his prayer ground. It was Coretta Scott King that said in her book, Standing in the Need of Prayer, that prayer has been such a crucial force, a sustaining hope, through the African-American experience. And she recalls in that book how one night as Martin was bone wearied, she said, from the struggle in the midst of the Montgomery bus boycott. That he comes home one evening and he's just, he's just, he's being attacked on every side. And late that night he receives a phone call. It was a threatening phone call one of many that had happened before but this night there, there was something about that 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 struck a very nerve in martin and martin gets up coretta says he makes a pot of coffee he bows down with his hands in his his head in his hands and he begins to pray he said lord all i'm trying to do is stand for what's right but yet i i've, I've come to the end of my strength i've done all that i could do Coretta says in that book, Standing in the Need of Prayer, when Martin got through praying that night, he stood up from the table a renewed man. He stood up from that table a man that had been filled with the power of God, with more courage and more strength. Prayer may not change your situation, but prayer will change you to deal with that situation. Number one, retreat to your prayer ground. Number two, write this down. You'll need this in days to come. Don't respond to your haters. Retreat to your help. That's what Daniel does. He does not even address the people that accused him. He does not even respond to those who have tried to malign him and criticize him. He goes straight to the Lord in prayer. That's good news this morning, church. To know that we serve a God that grants us access to the throne of grace. I'm getting happy in here. This wasn't in the, in the manuscript, but let me add this since I'm putting story over the soup this morning, that aren't you glad that we can go to God in prayer anytime that we want to? Aisle nine of the Smiths or the Kroger or the, or the Piggly Wiggly grocery store. Doesn't matter where you're at. You could be sitting at a bus stop or a stop sign where you could come boldly to the throne of grace. Here it is that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Isn't it good to know that we serve a God that hears our pleas for help? I've given you two points. Retreat to your prayer ground. Number two, don't respond to your haters. Retreat to your help. It was in 2016. The DNC, when Donald Trump goes on a tirade against Barack Obama, he literally just lits into him and criticizes him and, and, and just calls him all types of name and tries to malign his character. But he says not a word in response to Michelle Obama. Because Michelle Obama, when she addressed the situation, she didn't even mention his name. She just simply said that we ought to be careful because we should be careful of who leads this next generation. And she shared some intimate 
moments that her and Barack shared with their children that don't let other folk their label a label of you become your reality. And she closed with these famous words now that when they go low, we go high. That's a message for somebody on this morning. Don't stoop to the level of those who have tried to demean you. But pray and ask God to even bless them. I ask the Lord to even give my enemies peace because if they have peace, they'll stop messing with me. Retreat to your prayer ground. Don't respond to your haters. Retreat to your help. I'm done with this third point. Wait for the morning. <laughs> I like this text. It really just gets me happy because it was in verse 19 that morning time had came. I saw a picture of Rembrandt, his picture of Daniel in the lion's den. And it was a picture that showed Daniel in frustration and, and scared, but I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. I, I believe that God gave Daniel peace in that lion's den. As a matter of fact, I just believe my spiritual imagination that he used one of those lions as a peely postropedic mattress. And that Daniel laid down and got a good night's sleep. I, I don't think it was Daniel that was frustrated, but the text indicate it was the king that was frustrated. Probably didn't sleep all night long. The text says it, and by the morning time, he goes rushing down to the lion's den. Looks in and he says, oh, Daniel... He wants to know if Daniel is alive. And Daniel says, O king, live forever. Hootie hoo. The Lord has saved me. I like this text. I could go further, but I'm going to stop right there. Because Daniel really is a type of Christ in this text. Because he was praying and he was led to punishment because of his prayer. It was in that garden of Gethsemane that Jesus prayed with great drops of blood. He was on his prayer ground, God help me, when the enemies came in him. But I want to suggest on my way to heaven because heaven is my goal that the victory was already run on Calvary back in the garden of Gethsemane. Because your victories are not won on the battleground. Your victories are won on the prayer ground. I'm getting happy, but in the morning time, in the morning, there, there's going to be a change in the morning. That's, that's, that's what happens in the morning time. Daniel, he's transformed from the church militant to the church triumphant in the morning time. In the morning time, the lion will lay down with the lamb in the morning time. In the morning time, the foes will be your footstool in the morning time. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. I certainly pray that you were blessed by that message where victories are won. We don't want to take for granted that those of you that are, are listening to us uh, or watching us today, that you do in fact have a personal, and I do mean personal, relationship with Jesus Christ. Not one that your mother has or your father has, but a personal relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, whereby you talk with him on a daily basis. And by the aid of the Holy Spirit, he's assured you of your eternal security. If that's not the case, I want to extend to you the privilege of discipleship open up the invitation to the gateway of salvation. And that is the Bible simply says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. It's simply more than just saying, I've heard about Jesus, I believe Jesus, but accepting him in your heart and establishing a personal relationship believing that he indeed died, was buried, and that he rose with all power in his hands. If you believe that in your heart and have to confess that with your mouth, the Bible says thou shalt be saved. We certainly want to take for granted that 
everyone that's listening under the sound of my voice have connected yourself with the body of Christ. The natural response for the believer is to connect with likewise believers. We want to extend the privilege of the church, the Calvary Baptist Church. I want to suggest that, that you pray and ask the Lord for direction, but at the end of this broadcast, our decision time counselors will be available to help guide you through that process. Today could be the first day of the rest of your life. The doors of the church are wide open. Jesus left them that way. If you would like to become a part of this church, you can come by letter or a candidate for baptism based on the profession of your faith or for restoration. We have decision time counselors standing by to take your call at 801-355-1025 between the hours of 1 and 3 p.m. today. And have a blessed and wonderful day. Amen. I also want to encourage you. Let's pray for one another. Calvary, as many of us are going through different trials and tribulations in life. As, we, as we've had members that have been sick, let's keep our members lifted in prayer. We've had members that are bereaved. Let's also keep them in prayer. I also want to encourage you to let's be consistent as it relates to our financial responsibility. As members of Calvary, we believe and we espouse what the Bible gives us, not as a request, but as a mandate that we bring ye all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse. That's tithes and offering. Calvary, we've been consistent, but let's be consistent and represent the Christ in whom we serve. We want to thank those who have sent donations and offerings uh, by way of just local support. We certainly appreciate that, but we also extend the invitation to discipleship to you as well. If you have not a church home, Calvary is a great church, and we certainly open our arms to you. I pray that you have a good week. I pray that you will be prayerful for one another as we continue forward in this way. May God bless you and may God keep you is my prayer. The Church Women United is a nationwide organization of women from different Christian denominations, Baptist, Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, etc., who work together collecting donations, helping charities who help those in need. Our own sister Karen Bradicus is a member of this esteemed organization. The local Church Women United Salt Lake City Bountiful Branch is sending love, blessings, and this message to Calvary Baptist Church. We are praying that God will lead his people into a new time of acceptance and love in the community. Church Women United supports an end to racism and improved human rights. May God give us wisdom and compassion to move our country to a better, united society for all. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Calvary friends, family, and guests. I'm Robin Sherman, and I'm here to announce our 2020 Vacation Bible School. That's right, we're going somewhere. So get on board, cruising with God's family, Ephesians 1 and 5, that's our theme. Classes will begin the week of July 13th, and registration is now available online via Facebook and the website. If you have additional questions, please reach out to Sister Kathleen Christie. That's right, we are going somewhere. I know they have all the restrictions, but it's time to cruise. See you there. Hello, Calvary members and friends. As part of the continuing effort to provide relief for our members and the community at large during this COVID-19 pandemic, Calvary Baptist Church will be partnering with World Vision to distribute food products for families in need. This partnership will include working with the Point Church 
as the hub receiving the products and Calvary Baptist Church as a point of distribution to our members and our community at large. If you are interested in receiving the food products, which includes meat, dairy products, and produce, please contact the Calvary Baptist Church front desk at 801-355-1025 between the hours of 9.30 a.m. and 3 p.m. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for more information. Also, please note there are boxes of non-perishable goods available to members and the community. Contact Calvary Baptist Church for more details concerning the non-perishable good boxes. If you or your business are interested in donating to Calvary Baptist Church COVID-19 Food Relief Initiative, you may use Giblify.com, search for Calvary Baptist Church and make your monetary donation or mail your check to Calvary Baptist Church Attention COVID-19 Food Relief Initiative at 1090 South State. Salt Lake City, Utah, 84111. Thank you, and may God continue to bless you. Greetings. The IGBC Golf Tournament Fundraiser will be held July 17, 2020 at 8 a.m. The location is the Ridge Golf Course in West Valley, Utah. Entry fees are $320 for a team and $80 for individuals. Fees include 18 holes, cart, and lunch. Proceeds raised goes towards hosting the April 2021 Walter K. Jr. Far West Layman's Workshop being held in Salt Lake City, Utah. Deadline for registration is July 14, 2020. For more information and to register, please contact Deacon Dale Griffin at 801-564-564. 0922 or Deacon Greg Lane at 801-815-4761. Donations are welcomed as well. Thank you. Mm-hmm.